All right, on to Paladin, and we start with Conviction. One mana, give a random friendly minion plus three attack. And then at five mana, it gives two of your minions plus three attack. And at ten mana, it gives three random minions plus three attack. So yeah, one mana, give a minion plus three attack in Paladin. You obviously want to compare this to Blessing of Might. And Blessing of Might is a card that has seen play in the past. And uh, I think Conviction might just be a better card. Of course, there's the downside that it's a random friendly minion instead of a targeted one. But I do feel like generally in Paladin, in a deck that would play Blessing of Might, you like you tend to have a bunch of recruits, right? So they like all have the same stat line. Like maybe you have a couple that don't, but generally it seems like your minions have similar stat lines in this kind of Paladin deck. So it doesn't really matter that much that it's random. And you can like trade off your recruits to target your big thing with Divine Shield if you really need to. So I don't think being random is too terrible. And then of course once you hit 5 mana, then suddenly it's doing twice as much as Blessing of Might. If you ever get to 10 mana, it's doing 3 times as much. Um, if you hit 10 mana, this is like 1 mana Bloodlust basically, which is insane. But even at just the second rank, 1 mana deals 6 damage is a crazy amount of damage. I mean, rogues play Sinister Strike in their deck, right? That's 1 mana deal 3. So yeah, I think Conviction is just a really strong card in any sort of Paladin deck that's trying to end the game. Um, if Paladin ends up just playing, like, some sort of slower Librem deck, this probably won't make the cut. But I have to imagine that the, like, low-curve secret aggro tempo thing that seems to be getting pushed is probably pretty interested in this card, because man, it does a lot of damage. Um, it is also a holy spell, for what it's worth. Um, there is Cariel Rome that discounts your holy spells, so this will be a zero mana card that's really strong. There's the War Medic that uh, wants you to play cheap holy spells. So it has some upside there as well, but I don't think... I think even without the holy tag, this card is probably just pretty good in Paladin decks. Next up we have Galloping Savior. One mana secret. After your opponent plays three cards in a turn, summon a 3-4 Steed with Taunt. So I would say the obvious comparison for this card is going to be the Hunter Secret, Rat Trap. Which, uh, you know, did basically the same thing. After your opponent plays three cards in a turn, uh, Rat Trap you summoned a 6-6, this summons a 3-4 with Taunt. Obviously a 6-6 is bigger. But uh, the Galloping Savior here costs half as much mana, and you get slightly more than half as many stats with the Taunt as well. So I think this card is just, like, pretty good. Half as much mana for half as many stats. Uh, Rat Trap was a really, really obnoxious card to play around in the past. Like, sometimes you just can't really afford to not play three or more cards in a turn. So yeah, I think the card just on its own is, like, pretty reasonable. And then Secrets are just being pushed so hard in the Paladin class right now that I think this has to end up seeing play. Um, I guess the, uh... I guess the main consideration with this card is going to be, uh... Just, like, you can only play a certain number of secrets in your deck, right? And Paladin has access to quite a few good secrets right now, between Avenge, Reckoning, Oh My Yog, maybe Noble Sack. Like, maybe you don't also need Galloping Savior. But uh, even if you play two of all those others, that's only eight secrets. And with like Sword of the Fallen, maybe eight secrets isn't enough. Or, you know, maybe Galloping Savior just ends up being better than Noble Sack. Maybe you play like one of each because, uh, I mean, with the sword, you don't necessarily want two of all your secrets because then sometimes you can't actually pull one of them or something. So yeah, I mean, I think Galloping Savior is just a good card. Hard to play around. Gives you a one mana three four taunt. And secrets are being pushed so hard in Paladin that it's kind of hard to imagine it not seeing play. Next up we have Knight of Anointment. One mana, one one, battle cry, draw a holy spell. So yeah, I mean this card is really good. One mana, draw a card. So I would say there are a couple pretty obvious comparisons for this card. Uh, both Town Crier and Kobold Librarian come to mind as... One mana minions that draw a card. Both of those cards were pretty insane. They went in most decks that could play them. And I think this is a pretty similar power level to those. 
Obviously, it's losing one stat from each of them. But I think being able to draw a holy spell is just, like, better overall than having to draw a rush minion or having to take two damage. Because when you look at the holy spells, or when you look at the, uh, the paladin spells, I guess, uh, it turns out that just, like, all of their spells are holy. We have a bunch of them that are, like, you know, marked as holy. But I'm pretty sure that, like, Hand of a Doll is also going to be holy. The Librem cards are going to be holy. You've got your board clears with the Equality Consecration. The Blessings. I mean, it's just, like, all of the good Paladin cards are holy spells. So, I mean, it seems like there's, like, basically not even a deck building restriction on this card. You just play it on turn one, it draws a card. It's, uh, it's Novice Engineer for half as much mana. I mean, it's just a good card. I mean, you just put this in all of your Paladin decks, regardless of archetype. I mean, I guess, like, maybe one bad thing about this card is that you play your... You have your uh, secret sword thing that pulls all your secrets, and sometimes this draws a secret, which is a bit of anti-synergy. But, uh, I mean, you probably have, like, a bunch of other holy spells in your deck. And even if you don't, it's still insane. This card's just great. It goes in all your Paladin decks. Next up, we have Soldier's Caravan. Another Caravan card. 2 mana 1-3 at the start of your turn. Summon 2 1-1 Silverhand Recruits. So, yeah, I mean, 2 mana 1-3 at the start of your turn. You have to imagine this thing is probably just dying pretty often. But compared to the Hunter one we looked at, this one is at least pretty good tempo. Like, if you coin this out on turn 1 and your opponent can't answer it, I mean, it can get a lot of value, but like the two two the uh, the two one ones you summon, they come at the start of your turn, so you can't like attack with them to protect the soldier's caravan. So you need like something else to protect it. I guess you could play like a weapon this turn, maybe, but I don't think Paladin has any uh, like two mana weapons that would be good here. I mean, the Sword of the Fallen, of course, but uh, that's not actually going to be killing much. I guess maybe if you're up against something that doesn't play anything till turn 3, then the, uh, the Underlight Angling Rod would be a pretty good backup to this. But uh, I feel like most of the time, it's just going to get value traded over. You might get a couple 1-1s one out of it, but like even then, how good? I mean, 2 mana 1-3 that summons 2 1-1s one is pretty good. But uh, it seems really hard that you would ever get more than that, and if you ever get less than that, this card is just absolutely awful. I will say, though, that out of the caravans, I think this is maybe the one that could see play. Just because Paladin cares so much about their token stuff, that, like, maybe just the risk of this card is worth it, because if it hits, it's so strong. Maybe I'm thinking of this too much as a 2-drop, though. Maybe this is more like a Voracious Reader kind of card. I mean, like, Voracious Reader... I mean, Voracious Reader is at the end of your turn, right? So... Even if it dies, it, like, does something for you. But, I mean, it's still a 1-3 that you play in the late game. It's not like Voracious Reader just automatically dies the turn you play it. It's, like, a pretty obnoxious card to deal with. Maybe this is more of a reload for Paladin than a 2-drop. But I guess Paladin is going to have their, like... They have Stand Against Darkness for this effect. They have the 3 mana. They have Day at the Fair as well. I don't know, even for that sort of effect, this is probably just not good enough. Next up we have Sword of the Fallen. 2 mana 1-3, after your hero attacks, cast a random, or cast a secret from your deck. Uh, I alluded to this card earlier, and this card is just really insane. It's like super broken. If you... Like, if you just assume that all your secrets are worth 1 mana, as a 2 mana 1-3 weapon, this is worth like... One mana, not quite one mana, actually, compared to Light's Justice. But, I mean, it's basically, like, a two mana card for four mana worth of stuff in play. And the secrets, you actually get to draw and play them. So it's kind of like the Mysterious Challenger effect, where that deck so often just, like, curved all of their big stuff in the end game because they pulled out all the small garbage of their deck, so they were just drawing into big stuff. Sword of the Fallen does, like, kind of the same thing but it starts even earlier in the game. So, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, this card just seems really strong. I mean, it's not, like, totally insane, because a 2-mana 1-damage weapon is pretty underwhelming. But it's just so much value from this card. It also sets up for, like, if you have no secrets in play, then turn 5, when you want to play Cannon Master Smith, you just attack with the sword, and then you can get value out of the smith. There's another Paladin card, or there's actually a couple other cards that come down on turn 3 that care about secrets. I mean, this card's just insane. People are calling it the best card in the set, and for good reason. Maybe not the best, but certainly in the conversation. And uh, yeah, because of this card, you probably just play, like, all these Paladin secrets. There's probably going to be, like, some aggro Paladin thing that wants to play this, but even if you're playing, like, Control Paladin, maybe you just jam secrets in your deck so you can afford to play this card. Yeah, it's just really good. Uh, next up we have Northwatch Commander, 3 mana 3 4, Battle Cry. If you control a secret, draw a minion. See, so yeah, I was talking about this card with the sword. Um, if you have the sword in play, then this card is just always active on turn 3. And then it's 3 mana 3 4, Battle Cry, draw a minion. And uh, I think it's actually pretty good that this is draw a minion instead of draw a card, because then you're not drawing your secrets when you already have a Sword of the Fallen in play. And uh, just generally, you'd probably prefer not to draw your secrets in general. So yeah, I mean, there's not really much to review about this card. If you're playing secrets in your deck, you just play this, and you're probably playing secrets in your deck because you're Paladin and can play Sword of the Fallen. So yeah, I mean, it seems like all this secret stuff is pretty much just going to dominate the Paladin class for the foreseeable future, I would say. Alright, so that's all of the Paladin cards that I hadn't reviewed previously, but I guess just for completion's sake, I'll touch on the ones I have reviewed already. Uh, Carriel Roam, 4 minute 4 3 Rush Divine Shield is already a good card. It has the upside of discounting holy spells in your hand, and like all of the good Paladin spells are holy spells. So yeah, I mean, this card's just insane. Invigorating Sermon. I think Keliseth, that doesn't come down till turn 4 and doesn't have a body, is probably just too slow. It's a nice little bit of a board buff, but I think, like, Conviction is going to do that better. I think this just doesn't do enough at the point in the game that it comes down. Veteran War Medic, I initially reviewed this pretty positively because it's pretty easy to get cheap holy spells between Cariel Rome and, like, Librem of Wisdom. And even just, like, playing things for one mana is fine. So it's just, like, Violet Teacher with a massive upside. But man, they have made so many strong Paladin cards this set that I actually don't know if you can afford to play this card. I think it's strong, but it's just like, you can only put 30 cards in your Paladin deck, and Paladin has some crazy shit. And then finally, Cannon Master Smith. It's basically just a bad petting zoo, but with as hard as Paladin is pushing secrets this set, I think petting zoo is just a good Paladin, or I think bad petting zoo is just a good Paladin card. So uh, yeah, and with the Sword of the Fallen in particular, the synergy with this card is just so insane. So yeah, I think Cannon Master Smith is probably going to be pretty good. And then moving on to Priest, I guess, I think I also already reviewed four Priest cards. I'll just power through those real quick so we're all on the same page. But a uh, Desperate Prayer, zero mana heal five to each hero. I mean, as Priest, you don't care about healing your enemy, so it's just zero mana heal five to you. There's some other Priest cards in the set that care about healing you. And even if they didn't, it's just a lot of healing to shut down an aggro deck, and then, you know, you, like, play a taunt, and it's going to be pretty hard to die. It is a very low-value card, which Priest is, like, losing their Galakron, so they might not be able to afford playing that. But with the new, like, dragons in the core set, they still have, like, Sethic Veilweaver. I think this card is just going to be pretty reasonable. And then we have Condemn. I think this AoE is just, like, all the breakpoints on it are so bad. Up until turn 4, it only does 1 damage, and then like finally on turn 5, you unlock Consecration. But Consecration in a class that doesn't have a quality effect. I think the breakpoints on this card are just pretty underwhelming. And then we have Priest of Anshi. So this is a card that combos with Desperate Prayer. If you play it as a 5 mana 8-8 eight, eight taunt, that's like pretty freaking insane. Um, you can set that up as I said with Desperate Prayer, like maybe Lifesteal. I don't know. But, like, even if you're just playing it as a 5 mana 5-5 five, five taunt, I think that's, like, pretty fine in a lot of situations. So, overall, I think this card is just, like, pretty reasonable. Maybe not a top 30 card for your pre-stack, but something you consider, I would say. 
And then the last of the priest cards I've already touched on is Light Shower Elemental. This card's just really good. It's just a ton of stats, a ton of healing, all wrapped up into one card. Um, it's good for Nazoth as well. It's a 6-6, which it's like rare for priest to have minions that can actually pressure the opponent. So yeah, this card is just good and probably goes in most slow priest decks. But now, let's finally move on to some priest cards that I haven't reviewed yet. And we're going to start with a legendary Zyrella. Uh, four mana, four four battle cry. If you've restored health this turn, deal that much damage to all enemy minions. So yeah, the obvious combo with Zyrella is going to be Desperate Prayer from this set. So zero mana, you heal five to each hero, which means Desperate Prayer actually can be healing for up to ten. And then you play Zyrella, and it AOE's for you know five ten damage, which is an insane AOE, particularly on turn four. Um, now, as Priest, on turn 4, is your opponent's health going to be below 30? Probably not, but maybe if they're like Zoo, playing Flame Imp and Life Tapping and stuff, then it conceivably could be. But, uh, I mean, if you're up against aggro, then it's, like, pretty likely that your health is below 30, so it's pretty easy to set up with Desperate Prayer. Uh, Desperate Prayer is the only, like, real reasonable way to get too much out of this on, uh, on Curve. With Priest of Anshi, I was talking about, like, setting up a Reliquary of Souls, but Reliquary of Souls only heals you for one, and this does, like, one AoE. That's not really that impressive. The only lifesteal thing that would be really good with this would be, like, Apotheosis. And if you have an Apotheosis minion, then, uh, you're probably not real crazy about AoEing everything for three damage or whatever, because your Apotheosis minion is just going to die. Wow, I just, uh, I was editing this video, and I just reread this card and found out that it's deal damage to enemy minions only. So yeah, with Apotheosis, this is actually pretty sick. You, uh, like, Apotheosis your thing, your opponent can't kill the Apotheosis thing, they play some stuff to kill your Apotheosis minion, and then you just nuke their board. That's, uh, actually pretty nuts. That means that you can maybe even play this in, like, a tempo deck with, like, Rally. Plus, uh, I believe... When it says restoring health, that counts for like healing a blade master too. So yeah, pretty pretty nasty synergies with this card, even if you're not playing a control priest. So yeah, on curve, we're pretty much looking at Desperate Prayer. But just one turn off curve, you can play like Renew. Renew is a really insane paladin card. Um, you've also got Flash Heal. Uh, and, uh, you know, turn five, dealing like three AoE is pretty reasonable. Dealing five AoE is really strong. So yeah, I mean, that seems pretty fine. But, uh, I mean, this isn't a card that you have to play on curve. You can just, uh, this is the kind of thing that maintains relevance for the rest of the game. And then, you know, like, turn, what, seven? You can hero power, flash heal, and then AoE for seven. That's, like, pretty strong. So yeah, I mean, it's just a good card. Sometimes it's really good on curve, and it maintains its relevance late into the game. So yeah, I think, like... I was a little bit iffy on whether or not Desperate Prayer would see play, but I think Zyrella is a... It's a pretty strong incentive to, uh... to put the Desperate Prayer in your deck, so, uh, yeah. I like this card a lot. Next up we have Power Word Fortitude. 8 mana. Give a minion plus 3, plus 5. Costs 1 less for each spell in your hand. So, if you can discount this four times, then, uh, I mean, it's basically Blessing of Kings, right? If you can discount it that much. And Blessing of Kings is a really, really strong card, right? It has, uh, seen a lot of play in Paladin. But, uh, this card's weird, though, right? Because typically in your Blessing of Kings deck, you want to be playing, you know, minions. So you can buff them with Blessing of Kings. But Power Word Fortitude wants you to be playing a ton of spells in your deck. So, like, if you're just tempoing out 2-drop into 3-drop into Power Word Fortitude, then, like, how likely are you to have 4 spells in your hand? It seems pretty unlikely, honestly. And realistically, like, even if you're curving out like that, how much better is Power Word Fortitude than, uh, than just, like, sticking Apotheosis on your minion? Probably not that much better. And then if you're getting... Is Psyche Split still in standard? Yeah, Psyche Split's still in standard, so if you only have three spells in hand, Psyche Split's just way better. 
we actually still have power infusion. So it's just like, I don't know, it feels like Priest has better buff cards. Does the deck that even wants to play this, like, can afford to play this many spells? Seems kind of weird. Like, maybe you can play this in, like, Miracle Priest with Nazmani Bloodweaver. And, like, that deck plays a ton of spells, so this is going to be pretty cheap. Maybe you just play this as, like, another cheap spell in that deck? But I feel like that deck cares so little about the buff that uh, it's probably not going to see play. I don't know. I think this card is just, like... I, I mean, like, the power level of the card is theoretically fine. It just seems like it lines up in a really weird way in the Priest class. So it probably won't see much play. Next up we have Void Flare, 4 mana 3 4, battle cry for each spell in your hand. Deal 1 damage to a random enemy minion. So this is another spell priest card. But this is one that I think actually has some potential to see play. Uh, probably want to compare this to Dynamatic. Okay, yeah, I figured out how to spell it. Dynamatic which was a warrior card that saw a lot of play. Same stat line, one more mana, and it dealt five damage, which ended up being quite good. So Void Flare, I mean, let's say this needs to deal four damage to be good, I guess. One less mana, one less damage, maybe like somewhere in between three to four damage is what you need out of this. Um, I mean, I guess that's pretty reasonable that in your hand you'd have like a Desperate Prayer and a Holy Smite, maybe a Renew... Uh, Shadow Word Death or something. So yeah, I, th I think it's like pretty reasonable that a Control Priest would have this many spells just sitting in their hand. And compared to the Power Word Fortitude, if you're just playing like some Sethic Veilweaver nonsense, you're probably just gonna have a bunch of random garbage in your hand for the rest of the game anyway, even if it's not like cards you're planning to play, then you can just use those to activate the Void Flare. That's like pretty reasonable. So yeah, I think like and compared to the Power Word Fortitude, like, you don't need to have a board for this, right? Like, that's the... That's the thing, like, Priest can have a lot of spells in their hand, but they're not gonna have a board to go with it, necessarily. So, yeah, that's where I think the Void Flare kind of separates itself as a Spell Priest card. And, uh, Priest is losing Breath of the Infinite, so they could use some more AoE. This seems like it fills that role pretty nicely. I think this is just going to be, like, the better new Priest AoE than uh, Condemn. So yeah, I mean, card is just pretty good if there's a Control Priest deck, I think. Next up we have Devouring Plague. 3 mana, lifesteal, deal 4 damage, randomly split among all enemy minions. So yeah, um, I guess you compare this to, like, Penance, which I believe is rotating. So yeah, compare it to Penance. Uh, Penance is 2 mana deal 3, this is 3 mana deal 4, which uh, plus 1 mana for plus 1 damage isn't necessarily a great trade-off. But when you have Lifesteal, that 1 damage is worth a little bit more than 1 damage, right? And Devouring Plague compared to Penance can kill, like, a Gibberling board from a Druid, or it can kill, you know, like a Spy Mistress that's hiding in its stealth, or Spy Mistress plus Greyheart Sage. So, I actually think this card is pretty good. It's a pretty flexible AoE. It clears, like, all sorts of boards that Priest would care about. And even if you do end up getting kind of a bad split on this card, the healing kind of offsets it. Like, if you, uh, they have, like, two one health things and a three health thing, you probably want to kill the three health thing, but even if you don't, you still heal for four, which, uh, is pretty nice. I think this is just a solid Priest removal spell. I talked with uh, the previous card that Priest was looking for a Breath of the Infinite replacement. This might be more so the Breath of the Infinite replacement. Comes down on the same turn, and it kills a lot of the same kinds of boards. Although, not quite as many as Breath of the Infinite. Um, also worth noting that this has really good synergy with Flesh Giant because I believe, at least, that each of the missiles heals separately. So I think this is just going to be four instances of healing for Flesh Giant, which is going to make this card really easy to play for a small amount of mana. 
I don't know how much support Flesh Giant Priest really has in Standard right now. But, uh, like, we're losing Grave Rune. But you can always copy it with Psyche Split. Could be pretty good. But yeah, I think this card is just a good Control Priest tool. Next up, oh boy, we have another Caravan. 2 mana, 1, 3. At the start of your turn, copy a spell from your opponent's deck to your hand. Um, I think this is definitely pretty underwhelming. I think even as far as Caravan cards go, this one is not very good. I think Priest just has better ways to do... to, uh... to gather random stuff from the opponent's class, or the opponent's hand and deck, rather. Wait, are we actually losing Thought Steal in the core set? Wow, we are. Hmm, interesting. But, uh, this still seems a lot worse than, like, Psychic Conjurer. Seems worse even than playing, like, Draconic Studies. And as a priest in particular, I don't think your 2-mana 1-3 is surviving very often. But I will say that if you're playing some buff stuff in Priest, then, like, this ends up being a really good target for Apotheosis, or maybe even, like, Dragon Maw Overseer. But, uh... Yeah, I mean, I think it just seems like a card that you're going to play on turn two in your priest deck and it's just going to die. And then finally for the priest class, we have Serena Bloodfeather. Two mana, one one with battle cry. Choose an enemy minion, steal attack and health from it until this has more. So the way this works is basically the attack and health stealing are independent. So... Like, say this goes up against a 3-2. You target a 3-2, you steal one of each of its stats, so now you have a 2-2, and they have a 2-1. So at this point, your health is higher than the opponent's health, that means you stop stealing health, but because your attack is tied, you still steal another attack. So you end up with a 3-2 versus their 1-1. One -one. I believe I've explained that correctly. But yeah, anyway, this just seems like sort of a solid 2-mana priest pseudo-removal thing. If your opponent has, like, a 10-10, and you target this, target that with a, with a Serena, then you end up with a 6-6 six, six to their 5-5. Five, five. So 2-mana 6-6 six, six that takes 5-5 five, five off their board. That's pretty strong. But as a priest, you do have to kind of wonder, like, why didn't you just cast Shadow Word Death in that position? Like, instead of there being no minions in play, you decided that it was better for you to have a 6-6 six, six and for them to have a 5-5. Five, five. Which, I mean, you are ahead on board in that scenario, 6-6 six, six versus 5-5. Five, five. But if you're worried about dying, like, sometimes a 5-5 five, five still just kills you, right? And, you know, they can always play some sort of removal thing of their own, and then they still have a 5-5 five, five that you need to deal with. So, Serena Bloodfeather is definitely a bit of a weird card. I think it's definitely, like, most impressive when it's hitting, like, 10 10s or 8 8s or whatever. But I think if we go back to the example I gave of this versus a 3-2, I think that's just, like, more so the application of this card. In the early game, like, say your opponent plays Greyheart Sage, you play this to target the Greyheart Sage, and now suddenly you have a 3-3 and they have a 1-1. Like, that's a really relevant tempo swing. You're probably not dying to that 1-1 and you've gotten Serena down early enough that it can fight for the board and actually save you some health in the long run. I think that's more so the application of Serena Bloodfeather. It also could theoretically put something... I guess it could put something in Shadowward Pain range, but Shadowward Pain is gone, it looks like, which is interesting. It's actually really weird that they got rid of Shadowward Pain, but I guess they also got rid of, like, Frostbolt, so whatever. But anyway, yeah. Um, so Serena, definitely a weird card, but I think it's probably just pretty good in, like, aggro and tempo matchups. Still has its applications and control matchups. I've also heard that this, like, counters Rattlegore, but I'm not totally sure how true that is. I don't know if Rattlegore is, like, hard-coded to always go from the 9 to the 8 to the 7, or if, like, if you shrink Rattlegore with this, does it actually go from, like, 9 down to 4, or whatever it would be. Like, that would be a pretty pretty strong application of this card, if that is the case. But I can't confirm whether or not that's true. 
But yeah, anyway, I think this card is pretty good, but it's definitely something that maybe we play with for a couple days and we're just like, nah, I'd rather play Shadow Word Death on this minion.